Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Whether you are watching on YouTube or listening on a streaming service, this is Vocal Arts with Peter Barber. I am still in need of someone to pinch me because I got to have a full, wonderful, fun, interesting conversation with Janet Varney. Y'all, many of you probably know her as the voice of Korra in The Legend of Korra, one of the greatest animated shows ever made, one of my favorite shows. I really, I can't believe I got to speak with her and she was so lovely and genuine and fun and charming and it was just a really great conversation. Got to hear her whole upbringing of how she got into acting, how she got into voice work, how she actually got the gig for Cora, and what has happened in her career since which is a, a million very exciting things. It was such a joy and an honor to speak with her and I know you guys are going to really, really, really love this conversation. So huge shout out to Janet for taking the time to speak with me and I hope you guys enjoy. Please welcome Janet Varney. You want to go toe to toe with me, pretty boy? Let's do it. Let's go on a vacation, just the two of us. Anywhere you want. Sit down. Cuff yourself to the grate. Oh, come Cuff on. yourself to the grate. It's anchored to the floor. Being pregnant is the only time I've ever really felt special. I mean, since I stopped playing Clarissa on the Nickelodeon crew. Still think I'm a half-baked avatar? All right, hi everyone, wherever you are watching or listening, I am here with Janet Varney. And I'm actually going to pass the baton to her and let her give a little brief introduction as to who she is and what she's up to these days. Oh, thank you so much, Peter. I really enjoyed the audible smile in your voice when you said my name. That was like, I just want everyone to sound like they're smiling when they say my name from here on out. Um, <laughs> I'm Janet. Um, you know, listen, we're recording this during an, a, an actor strike. So it's, uh, I don't know how much I'm supposed to be talking about like things you might know me from. Um, so I would, I guess, encourage you to maybe go to my IMDb, which is a super gross thing to say. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've been working in, in comedy and TV and, and animation um, for a little while now. And uh, I also created and produce a comedy festival in San Francisco every year um, that I started in college and that's now been going for <clears throat> like 20 years, which is an uncomfortable feeling for me in some ways. Um, yeah, so, and yeah, a lot of people know me in animation. Um, I, I guess I can say in animation because it's not part of our contract strike that you might know me as a voice of Korra from The Legend of Korra, which is why I end up getting to do a lot of comic cons and meet people in person and talk about how much they love the avatar verse uh, which i also love so i will nerd out about it forever amazing we will definitely be nerding out about Great. the avatar verse on this show for sure i'm actually interested first though to wind the clock back um, i'm interested in you know your background and kind of formal training as an actor um, sure and and how you kind of found your way into the acting scene sure um yeah so i I mean, listen, I was a kid who grew up in Tucson, Arizona with, uh, I'm sure, more resources to learn how to act than I took advantage of. Um, I definitely had friends who were in like, you know, outside of school kind of theater classes. I, I remember I had a kid I went to school with who was on a Nickelodeon show that shot at old Tucson at the time. And yet at the same time somehow i was like i don't know i'm just a kid like i'm just going to school so i went to public school um but they were magnet schools that you know would specialize in different areas that's still a thing that still happens and so the ones that i went to were arts oriented so um i definitely got to do school plays um from first grade forward and always loved to try out and you know hopefully get to act in them but you know they were also public schools so we were performing in the cafeteria it's not like we had you know some slick like theater or whatever uh and then when I got to college, I had sort of I, I went to an in-state school because I got a like a full ride to anywhere in the state. And so I went up to Flagstaff, Arizona, which is just really the most northern part uh, that still has a university, i.e. I wanted to get away from the heat as quickly as possible. So I was up in the mountains. Flag is very cool. If you know, like Boulder or any number of other kind of like mountain college communities, it was a very, very cool place to go to school. 
But I also had always wanted to move to San Francisco. I just fell in love with San Francisco when I was 13 when I visited it. So I ended up majoring in theater there and they had a wonderful theater department, really, really great uh, theater department. But, um, you know, I, I was very pragmatic about acting by the time I got into college. I kind of didn't really think I would ever be able to make a living doing it. So, but I honestly like just didn't know what else to major in. <laughs> so for anybody who's watching, who can relate to that, who understands the feeling of being a young person and being like, you know, I have this thing I like, but uh, is it a career? I don't know, but also I don't know who I am or what I want to do. Cause I'm, you know, in my case, I was 17 when I went to college, like that's very normal. And so I kind of majored in it. I just point that out because I like sort of backed into majoring it. I was like, I don't know what else to do. So I'll just do that. And, um, and then I ended up leaving, um, uh, flag. I ended up leaving Northern Arizona university to move to San Francisco, like halfway through college. And when I was there, I had already like pushed past the idea of becoming, uh, like, like graduating with a degree in theater and was like, this is cool. I'm going to be like an architect or an interior designer. I'll go like, I'll just throw away all my theater credits and I'll just like focus on that because I had like developed a real interest in that when I was, um, when I first kind of moved right before I moved to San Francisco and then when I moved to San Francisco. And then I found out that the, at the time, the SF state, this is made me sound like it's the fifties. Trust me, it was super weird then, but the degree you would get in interior design and architecture what fell under home ec. And I was like, they didn't even have home ec when I was in high school. Like, that's a thing I think about. And I understand that, like, that's not true everywhere. But in my mind, I was like, that's the 50. Like, that means that you, like, put on an apron and, like, make cakes. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that is definitely not where my head was. And so it gen it genuinely was for that reason alone that I was like, mm, I guess I'm getting I guess I'll just keep going in theater. And that's the only reason that I ended up meeting the people that I met. Um, through various, you know, theater history and shop and acting classes and stuff that I ended up doing sketch comedy with. And I had never done comedy before, but these friends of mine were like, we want to form this group. Like, let's just get together and write sketches and improvise and be stupid and mess around and hang out. And I ended up kind of doing that for, you know, just like the social reason of it. But we ended up performing in San Francisco and ended up getting scouted by a couple of different people like we got scouted by mad tv and we got scouted by the hbo comedy festival which was in aspen at the time and was kind of this prestigious like that's where flight of the concords were discovered and like napoleon dynamite screened there and so that was like the thing that um ended up kind of dragging me kicking and screaming down to la so i'm not a good example for people who you know think like i'll just like leave high school and move to la and become a star i definitely was like no that doesn't make sense don't do it that's like you're you got to get an education and it, it was a very roundabout way that i was you know kind of pulled back into it and then i went down to san uh, i went down to la from san francisco um after that hbo festival to do like you know just chill on someone's couch every night and uh go out and do auditions and stuff and then i started getting jobs and i had to sort of admit to myself like oh yeah this is what i want to be doing and i you know i it just i had to like come around the long way and know you know what it felt like to have like other adult jobs and stuff in my 20s and you know yeah so for sure that's, that's really that's interesting a long that story you, but no thank you for sharing so that's interesting that you got into that world via just doing sketch for fun and then that way got discovered, which means you guys must have really had something going on. Yeah, I and don't know if that's true. Was... <laughs> <laughs> I love those guys and I still do my comedy festival with them. But so we that is the sketches. that's the same group that you now do the SF sketch fest. With. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we were in a sketch group. It was uh, three friends of mine and me. And we were in a group called Totally False People, which we had named ourselves after the kids in the hall. Um, they it was like a quote that some what one of the kids in the hall said at some point and we just thought it was like a funny thing when like it was like an answer someone asked something and he was like oh totally false people and we we're like wait that's like a fun that makes sense because we're doing sketch we're just like characters and um and so that so yeah i mean it was it was super dumb but yeah i i you know i had not like for having taken all these theater classes and really loved acting 
and kind of also being like, yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of funny, I guess, you know, I'm the, I'm a little bit of a class clown and, you know, um, my dad has a great sense of humor. Um, it's very, very funny and very performative, but was an English teacher. So it was like using all of that to educate kids. Um, I, I was very afraid of trying to do comedy. I had that fear of like, oh, this, you're the person that people are like, no, you're funny. You should do this. And then you do it and they go, oh, you're not funny. No, we were wrong about that. So sorry. Sorry. You're gonna have to like, your, your whole identity is now in jeopardy. <laughs> so, comedy, comedy seems terrifying to me. And I, I perform all the scary. time as yeah. a singer, as a singer, I perform all the time, but the idea yeah. of, of getting up and intentionally trying to make people laugh, yeah. is, that's horrifying to me. I cannot imagine doing that, especially, you know, if a set goes wrong, like the idea, yeah. of the idea of bombing is probably the scariest that, 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 that <laughs> that just what like a horrible, <laughs> totally what a horrible feeling and uh, by the way i don't do stand-up so that's still true for me like i have no interest in being on stage by myself having written a bunch of stuff i hope people will think is funny that seems horrible to me and the amount of time that you have to put into yes bombing like every person i can think of i know and i know a ton of stand-ups are all like oh yeah you feel like hell like all the time you feel terrible and you just have to push past that whereas i you know coming from sketch i kind of stopped doing sketch because there's just so many like wigs and costumes and props and stuff but um but improv i really really took to because it is so community oriented and i love like it's a team it is they call it a team for a reason um i love that i love team sports i love the feeling of like i got your back you got my back and that's one of the things uh, that you do backstage um i'm trying to think if i've ever performed with a group who didn't do it um or even where it comes from or who started it but you backstage you like tap some the person on the back every person you tap on the back and you say i got your back and they say i got your back to you and so you go out there feeling like you are a you're a part of a machine and if you even if you bomb your teammates are there to lift you up and make you look good and that's what you are doing for them and so it's a really fun experience and so it's scary because in that case you really have no idea what's going to happen you don't have a plan you don't have any ideas everything is born in the moment but that's also what's so exciting and cool about it is that you you know you're just present and you have to listen and you have to and i feel like that's helped me in the rest of my life as well like pay attention and be supportive and you know don't just like yeah you know? it sounds like foundations for becoming a really good colleague in any field you go into essentially yeah i recommend it i recommend people take an improv class as scary as that sounds even <laughs> if they have no intention of you know pursuing it in very any way. cool very cool okay yeah. so then you moved to la and you're auditioning and you're doing you're doing the audition thing what was the first gig that popped up and what I was think, the first gig that popped up that you were like really jazzed about? Oh yeah, great question. I have so many questions I want to ask you, but I guess that's this is you're, you're not you're, you're this is not ask that. away. We, we, um, usually these these become rather organic, which is really nice. Well, I was going to ask you if you've ever taken an improv class. I have only done improv within acting classes. Got it. For got it. Got it. Got it. Usually for opera. But okay. We'll yeah. Br we'll bring in like. That's the one. Was my question was going to be like how much yeah. of that would ever like tiptoe into opera is that even a thing so it sounds like uh, it is a little bit it can i mean especially if because things go wrong it is live performance and you've got orchestra conductor all the tech everything all the singers all the costumes i mean things go wrong all the time whether it's yeah. dropping a line someone forgets a translation and just looks like a goofball out there uh -huh. someone's one time i was in a, in a production and we were tossing an apple around the guy uh -huh. missed it and the apple just went into the orchestra pit at <laughs> which point if it's a union orchestra, which I, I think they all are at this point, they can leave. Sure. If something falls into the really? pit, they can just leave. Oh, my God. I wonder if that's ever happened. Oh, it happens. Like, I guess the rule happened. I mean, I guess the rule happens for a reason. But does anyone ever take advantage of that? Or, or is, are any orchestras like, we're out of here? Bye. It has actually not not to a performance I've been in, but, it, yeah. but I know people who have been with orchestras that have just walked in the middle of a show. Whoa! Oh, that's yeah. so dramatic. <laughs> what fell into the audience that would cause that much strife? I think some kind of prop hit like hit an oh. instrument or hit, you know, yeah. it might have hit the harp or oh. or something. And, it, and you yeah. know, if if one artist gets up, usually they're all like, all right, we're all getting up. Talk about a team. Yeah. I, so guess. Like, I mean, I, I respect that. I was hoping that you would say that the apple just like magically flew back onto the stage. Like someone was <laughs> like, caught so it. Ding. And it was like, that was all supposed to happen, everyone. Ha ha ha. Unfortunately, we had to do the rest of that scene without the apple. 
the apple was gone no, from that crazy. from the show. How key was it? Not terribly key. Okay, good. <laughs> well, so like, yeah. We were doing an offer about Adam and Eve, and you <laughs> were supposed to take a bite of the apple. We didn't have it. So gone. Apple's gone. That fundamentally changed the entire course of the <laughs> pretend history of the It Bible. became no an offense. entire improv opera. That's right. Wild. That's right. <laughs> By the way, I would so show up for an improvised opera. Because, you know, that improv nice. has so many different, like, there's the Improvised Shakespeare Company, which is completely mind-blowing. I have seen Patrick Stewart, a.k.a., you know, Mr. Star Trek. That's yeah. not his name. Um, <laughs> but like Picard, I have seen him improvise sh fake Shakespeare with these guys who are in this troupe. And it is so funny. And it is so Shakespeare. Like the amount of training, <laughs> specific training you have to do to be able to improvise Shakespeare is up like appalling to me and i'm yeah. so impressed and i desperately wish i could do it but i've seen you know the henson company does amazing puppet improv where it's called puppet up and you like are speaking on behalf of the puppet but you're on stage in black so everyone can see you and the puppet and so you're sort of switching back and forth and it's kind of that's like puppet for puppetry for adults so there's like cursing and stuff but you're so <laughs> caught between like that challenge that we all have when we're confronted with a puppet it's like we forget that the person's there and the puppet becomes so real but then you also are checking in with the fact that there's an improviser who's coming up with all this stuff while also like holding an arm above their head i mean the amount of like chiropractic that i think my oh yeah my friends go through is insane <laughs> just um, gigantic right shoulders right just huge massive Jacked. right shoulders well it is i mean i'm sure for like i always think about that with opera just the physicality of doing any kind of physical performance on stage in the first place. And then I think about how quickly I lose my breath if I'm not like in training for it. The amount of like, just the amount of physical presence and capability that I'm sure you have to train for off stage yeah. to be able to do all of that is mind blowing to me. The op opera singing is pretty nuts. It's like kind of Olympic, Olympic yeah. level singing. Cause it's like three hours generally. <sighs> If you're in a big role, there's no microphones. So it's yeah. you against the orchestra with no microphone. That's so crazy. you're just you're just hollering yeah. for like three hours straight. So that is a very much endurance vocally and endurance as far as like breath support and your diaphragm is concerned. Yeah. I wouldn't say you have to be in great physical shape to do it unless there's a bunch of physicality in the role. Like you're like a big comedic role, you'd probably want to be in pretty good shape so you can yeah. Bounce around and really interact with people with a bunch of energy. But as yeah. far as the singing, it's like you can have just like a jacked diaphragm, uh -huh. and like you and like you'll be good. <laughs> I want a jacked diaphragm bad. Well, I just saw. Uh, I just went to a live show um, at the Santa Fe Opera, but it wasn't an opera. It was like Sylvanesso, which is uh, you know what is it like? I guess it's electronic. But um, and I, you know, it's seven thousand feet up there. It's like seventy one hundred feet, and so and she was like, sh she's out from Santa Fe they're on tour so they're going all over the place like all these different altitudes elevations whatever and she um she was you know like taylor swift level like physicality just like dancing like running around on stage and like still killing it with her voice and i thought i don't know how she's doing this like people get winded walking up the stairs to go to their seats at the opera house like yeah, if you're not amazing. if you're not a resident at that theater, how do you sing at all without just like completely falling over and needing oxygen? Yeah. You know, it takes time to acclimate. I was actually with Santa Fe Opera last summer. Oh I yeah, guess, summer 2022. Oh yeah. my god, that's such a great coincidence. And I remember it took me like a week, right, at, to get used to it, and especially vocally because it's not only altitude but it's really dry. So, so I, dry. Thank you for bringing that up because it is. It's so dry, which completely affects like, yeah, your vocal cords and yeah. your entire body and your hydration level. And 100 percent. Would you go back? Did you like it? Um, So I was an apprentice singer there. So I did a lot of covering the kind of big main stage roles and uh -huh. uh, singing a lot of the choruses. Yeah, it was like pretty brutal. It was just a yeah. lot. It was just a lot of work, a lot of performing. I would 100 percent go back to sing roles there like as a, yeah. as a main stage guest artist which is hopefully kind of where i'm headed yeah um because it's in a it's a phenomenal company i love yeah. living in santa fe i thought santa oh, fe was so cool so the, great. the opera Chapped house lips notwithstanding amazing. it's amazing yeah. yeah get your get your chapstick with you 24 7 mm -hmm. but get mm -hmm. the humidifier going at night yeah but yeah i love i actually loved living there for the summer <sighs> I just was i was just there as i said and i loved oh wait so isn't there like a moat of water like between the there was for the show that I was at yes. there was like yeah 
do you know what that's about is that like no to idea help? okay no all right idea. i thought maybe that would be like a thing that they would tell you because i was sort of we were trying to speculate like all right it felt like when the doors are open we were sort of closer to the back of the house and when the doors were open there was a really great breeze that was blowing you know from behind onto the stage we were like okay trying to be scientists like mm -hmm, all right so does it blow humidity across the top of the water and like help hydrate maybe, the maybe it cools off the conductor because he's kind of it's like uh, right behind his yeah, head or, yeah, her, yeah. or her head you know yeah. right there yep maybe okay. Maybe there's right, something. We gotta to do it. some internet research yeah, on we'll this do one. Yeah, some some recon about the yeah. Santa Fe Opera. <laughs> I love that you're there. That's amazing. That's amazing. That puts it into a totally different context for me. It was um, really cool. Okay, so what was I saying? Oh, first roll. Okay. Yes. So when I think I had was still maybe sleeping on, I was either sleeping on my friend's couch or I had just moved into an apartment um, in LA when I got a, a a tiny role in the movie Catwoman. Um, starring Halle Berry, winner hey. of a Razzie Award. And uh, and so that was, yeah, that was fun. Um, but it was, it was like, oh my God, it was such a long day. It was, uh, I feel like I got there in the afternoon and I got, and I wasn't finished until like five or six in the morning. Um, it shot all night, way longer than anybody had thought or anticipated and it was just very tiring it was just you know there's of course a lot of sitting around there were special effects you know hallie had to be on a, a rig so she was flying like jumping through the air and sort of flying cat like i guess <laughs> um and so yeah it was just a lot of like it was hard and then of course like my part essentially got cut so i'm very visible in the film briefly and because there's sort of i still like got to like they still focused on me for a shot um and i was in the credits and i'll get like a penny residual every you know six months but um <laughs> but that i just remember that feeling of you know having like driving back i think maybe i had moved into my i can't remember if i moved into the apartment or not but but just the feeling of like driving back when the sun hasn't even come up yet and just like feeling so tired when you're so tired anything might make you cry you know just the feeling of like oh and thinking is this what i signed up for you know it felt so good to get a little job but this was brutal like is it all gonna be like this um and so i yes i was excited to get it but um i can't say that you know that excitement necessarily persisted through the whole thing and then and then there was just a lot of like getting really close to stuff and kind of learning having to learn quickly i mean it was a little bit of a trial by fire because that's one thing i always tell when people are like oh my god so you just got scouted like ooh, someone just plucked you out of obscurity and like started putting you in front of in these rooms that people have to work so, you know you go oh, you got an agent right away like that must have been so amazing and yes i'm incredibly grateful that that is parts of that are the way it happened for me but i also you know, imagine like getting fast forwarded into a world that's extremely intimidating and really hard emotionally. Is it hard physically? It can be, but you know, yes, we're all children who get to like be made up characters. I'm not pretending for a second that that's not a dream come true. But to go from a place where like, you know, I was, I worked for an interior designer. I was a project manager. I did a good job when I was answering phones for them and they promoted me to a coordinator. And then I did a great job as a coordinator and they promoted me to a project manager and they gave me more money every time. And they were sad when I left and, you know, to go to LA. And, uh, and then here I am just thrown into this place where you audition for something you do a good job then you get to the next level and you're like "Ooh, this okay i know what this feels like it means you're getting rewarded for doing well and then you get to the end and you know i had to like like there was this one thing that happened really early on where i auditioned for just the casting director and then i then they brought me back to audition for the producers for this tv pilot and then they brought me back to audition for the studio test which was like me and you know five other girls or whatever and then they brought me back to test for the network, which was, I think, the CW. And so and then it was just me and two other girls. And then they called me to tell me I had gotten the job and that the offer was forthcoming. Me being my you know, managers and agents or whatever. And then like the next day they called and they're like, oh, you know what? Tori Spelling actually has a deal with the network and um, they're just going to give it to her. We're so sorry. 
So w- without having had any sense of how the business worked or like having worked as a waitress and waited tables and then gotten an agent and then, you know, had to have all these things that happen that sort of prepare you for that, I, it just, I just got punched in the face with it right away. And so there were a lot of moments like that moment driving home from Catwoman where I just thought, this is brutal. Like this just takes your heart and just stomps on it and no one gives a shit. Can I curse? Um, yes, you can curse. So, you know, there was, so I think that's a, that's kind of, I always tell people like, don't feel like my way is the only way or my way is the right way. I could have stood more preparation to better understand how hard that was going to be and to build the thicker skin all along the way. And so I had to build that thick skin quick, or I would have just like immediately moved back to San Francisco and been like, no, 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 no. This is dumb. I don't like this. This feels bad. <laughs> you know, that is so, wild. How many rounds there are. Oh my God. There can be so many rounds. There can be it, so many rounds. It is not that way in the opera world. I will say, <sighs> yeah, it is. You do. It, it is really competitive. Shockingly. I bet. No, I bet. Um, because there just aren't many spots available, really. Sure. So, like for example, for the Santa Fe Opera program, a thousand applicants, and I think forty get in. That's but, but crazy odds already. Half of those people are returning, so it's really more like a twenty out of a thousand. Yeah, that's... for for that apprentice program. So it's very competitive, yeah. but it's pretty much you send in your initial application with your pre-screening audition, so they get to watch you perform on video. That gets you in the door performing live. And usually that live audition is it. Maybe there's two rounds of live and then it's done. Yeah. But it's not like, because the people from the opera house are there in the room listening to you. It's not like the network and then a different set of administrative people and then a different set of administrative yeah. people, all that you have to like get checked off for. That's oh my God, totally. Crazy. It's nuts. That's crazy. And by the way, I'm like not even including like chemistry readings and work sessions, which work sessions happen so that they can prepare you for each, you know, the studio test and the network test. But people get cut from work sessions all the time. So that's like an addition in and of itself. You, you're you going there and yes, it's yours to lose in terms of getting going forward to the test. But there are absolutely times where many times where someone goes in for their work session before they go to, you know, Disney or whatever and something happens in that work session and the people that were championing you are like i don't know if they have good chemistry with the person we've already cast or whatever and so that's Woof. you can add like two or three more auditions um onto the pile so how just long is that had. audition process from your agents like hey yeah got you an audition to like you get signed for the show that's a great question i think it's it's different now. I mean, now everything's so different because of COVID and because just the whole process of like getting in front of people live is almost non-existent, which is, by the way, kind of a bummer. I mean, for some people, they get very stage fright, like they get very nervous having to go into some weird conference room and, you know, perform in front of people. But for people like you and me who kind of come from theater um, and it's, and for me in particular, coming from comedy, that's like my chance to sort of give a little something extra. You know what I mean? Like with an audition on camera, you're just tasked with doing the scene and it's considered, you know, kind of in poor taste to like improvise around the scene. Like you want to honor the writer's words. And so there are these like little rules that sort of are unspoken, which are like, maybe you can tag a little something on the end. And this is true for voiceover um, as well. But, uh, But when you're in the room, there's this like, you know, there's a little bit of downtime where you're just sort of like, able to kind of make fun of the table you're sitting at. Like there's something that gives it life that makes you feel like I'm a person. Hey, everyone, you're people. I'm a person. This is kind of what it's like to be around me. And so when that gets taken away, there's this feeling of like, oh, God, like I don't even get to have chemistry with anyone. I don't even get, you know, Um, and so that's definitely different. So now, like it's been a while since I've had to go through like a test process because so um, many of the roles that I've had uh, have been, I've just either been offered it or I've, you know, it's been, a, it's for whatever reason, it's been a, like a recurring role that just did not require me to do those things. And then also COVID again has now been several years. So everything's kind of changed, but, um, but that, yeah, that whole process is, is kind of bananas. And it can also foster like that feeling of there's not enough jobs for everyone. And, you know, these are your competitors and, you know, some people like try to psych each other out in like weird ways. And then other times you'll end up testing across people who are just wonderful and 
supportive and everyone understands like, hey, we got this far. We did something right. And now it's just kind of up to like you were too tall or we wanted to, you know, just go a totally different way. We wanted to cast with more diversity, which, by the way, is the best feeling about losing a role, like the best feeling losing a role is like, well, they didn't want a white woman. I'm always like, cool, that's to <laughs> completely understandable and totally fine. Um, so, yeah, so the whole process is um, but it can be yeah, it can be it can be kind of painful in the same way that like. Imagine your worst experiences like in middle school and high school feeling judged or feeling like you're getting bullied or, you know, people are like looking at your clothes and they're not fancy enough or like, you know, you're 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 a girl who grew fast and you're taller than everybody else or you're a boy who is feels small and everyone's taller. And like there are all these social pressures that make us feel certain ways about the way we look and dress and how our voices sound and all that and that's the reason i do a podcast where i talk to people about their teenage years is because when i came to la i was like what has happened like i'm back in ninth grade what is going on like i'm the things i care about i have not thought about to this level in such a long time and you know i feel the sense of like oh the cool kids oh the like you know the comedy nerds of this or that and so i was like wow i guess um you know certain of us end up like never really entirely leaving that behind. And so I'm always fascinated to sort of hear what people's experiences were like then and like kind of stack them up against like dumb stuff that we have to go through now, even as adults. I'm sure it's all very relatable. <clears throat> the I, I mean, thing, I, I think it is. Yeah, the kind of thing you think will end and you're like, wait, this is kind of this is kind of how it was yeah. all yeah. the way back, all the way back in high school. hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, I feel you there. Um, one piggyback off what you said before we get into your voiceover work, because I definitely sure. do want to yeah, talk about Cora. Definitely. Um, but one piggyback on auditioning. I feel like you can't give the panel the X factor over video. Exactly there's that, right. There's that X factor charisma. Yeah, you said it so well. That for me, for sure, it's some, a little bit on in auditions, but especially performances. There is just, there's three more gears. No matter what I'm doing in rehearsal, I can be giving it my all in rehearsal, truly. But I'll get on stage, downbeat with the orchestra, and I'm like, let's fucking get it. Yes. And then it just takes it up to a whole new, yes. whole new thing, no matter what. And that just you just can't do that on video. Yeah, you can't. It's a it's a total bummer. There's really something to be said for even just the energy of one other person in a room with you who has a stake in it, or you know. And yeah, you take that away, and it, there's just a flatness that. I agree. Like, I hope, I really hope for everyone's sake that that people start getting the opportunity to be in those rooms more because I think you're right. I think everyone wins. Like, you're going to get a better version of everything when you give people the opportunity to really shine. And 100%. you're going to get the right person, you know? 100%. So, yeah. All right. So, how did you move into animation work? And then, how did Cora come along? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so in this time that I, you know, had come down to LA, I had one of the things that you sort of, you know, there's just like little checklists that in a perfect scenario, you have, you have a manager, some people just have managers and managers are able to kind of open the doors to get them auditions, even without agents. That's pretty, um, pretty rare. Um, but there are also people who have just agents, which is, I think, more common. Um, but you and then you know then you have to find an attorney that's good at like helping the agents negotiate and like build your contracts and make sure those are all fair and um some people get a publicist depending on like how high profile their jobs are and how much they want to you know sort of um get their get their face and name out there which by the way publicists are so expensive they're so wonderful but if anyone is like maybe i should get a publicist let me just say i hope you have some spare change sitting around because <laughs> they work really hard for you, but they cost a lot of money. Um, and so, uh, and so there's all these different team members and, and a commercial agent is kind of part of that, uh, especially when you're getting started. Um, and so I had signed with this commercial agency and I was going out for auditions and getting some commercials and stuff. And I would see this like other area of the agency that was the voiceover part and i would see people going in with like scripts and coming out and i was like what's going on in there <laughs> and but i didn't have any vo experience and so i asked my agent you know what 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 would i have to you know what's going on over there and he was like yeah you know the the 
it definitely obviously being trained as just an actor actor is, is hugely important we don't just like take people in who decide they want to be a voiceover actor it's that kind of isn't a thing you have to be an actor and study acting um and uh and you know i would recommend if you haven't had any training that you know i can kind of put you in touch with a a, a coach or a class and you can kind of get a little more familiar with just what's different about it because suddenly you are your most of your tools are uh, muted if not removed entirely and there's also just like technical aspects to it that you know you have to sort of learn to understand and and do better with and some of them are really hard to get rid of and constantly you have to remind yourself like popping your peas is extremely like no one everyone pops their peas in life and that just means getting too close to your microphone and making a p -p sound um and it seems so simple but no one is thinking about that, including voiceover actors who work every day. When they're in real life, they don't have a mic in front of them. That mic's gone. You are popping your peas nonstop. That's how peas work. <laughs> um, but when you are, you know, when you're doing stuff on a mic all the time, that's just like a thing you have to turn on in your brain, which sometimes you remember to and sometimes you don't. So just little technical things like that. Um, and one of the other things I remember really appreciating from taking voiceover classes was, and this this kind of applies more for commercial voiceover, like, um, you know, more like commercial kind of stuff you would hear on the radio or stuff that would play on the internet that is more, you know, so let's go to McDonald's, blah, 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 you know, <laughs> um, or like, oh, do you ever get that? Not so fresh feeling, whatever, uh, that, that, that it's really easy to just kind of put it out there and just focus on, okay, I'm saying words, I'm reading words. I don't want it to sound like I'm reading but there's this other component that they teach you where you have to get really comfortable sort of pretending like it's just you and another person like that's a thing that especially advertisers want a lot of the time which is you know but who are you talking to <laughs> and so that and that's kind of a hard thing to fake when you really think about it it's kind of hard to sound like you know me, like you and me, you know, we go way back and that's why I have to tell you about this sandwich that's for sale right now. Uh, <laughs> you know, so some of that is just getting comfortable with stuff that, you know, in the same way that I never really felt comfortable auditioning for superhero roles, because as much as I could imagine doing it on stage, like on a set and stuff, when you're just like in a cubicle with someone and you have to be like, and pretend like, <laughs> you're moving something with your eyes i always felt kind of stupid like i did always sort of feel like oh boy i don't know if anyone's playing this you know um and so there's some of that that i think you have to overcome with voiceover too but from the beginning i had always kind of made clear like sure i'll audition for whatever we all want to work but i i the dream would be to you know get to be on a cartoon at some point or you know get to do something because that just seems like magic to me is you know just seeing getting to do different voices obviously always fun for anybody much less a comedian um and a sketch comedy person or an improviser it's fun to try on different voices and you know ages and all that genders um and so that's kind of what they knew to really try to look out for and i will say nickelodeon continues to be and has always been uh, a network that looks to comedians and um really appreciates what a person from the comedy world brings to the table when they're doing their shows they're they tend to have a lot of energy they tend to you know it's some of the and i feel like i because i belong in this group i'm comfortable saying this but i feel like the most adhd people i know in hollywood are voice actors <laughs> they're <laughs> funny voice actors their brains are just going a mile a minute and so even when you're not recording like people are just doing voices and joking and trying to make each other laugh and it's a very fun environment and so um it was very cool to start getting those opportunities and i would i definitely credit nickelodeon with being like a very early adopter of you know oh janet comes from comedy like you know let's bring her in let's see what she what she's got and so i had done a couple of things with them before I got the opportunity to audition for Cora, but not much and not very much time had passed that I had started auditioning for voiceover when that happened. Um, and so, yeah, and then and that was just a Nickelodeon audition that came through. I can't remember. I think the first time I auditioned, it was in person at Nickelodeon and it was just for, you know, the casting director. And then not unlike all the kind of experience I described 
before with auditioning for the the on-screen TV pilot, you know, I came back and auditioned for producers and there might have even been like another audition with producers. And then at some point there was like a chemistry read with where they were kind of mixing and matching a couple of different actors that they were sort of thinking about for, I think it was mostly um, like, well, I remember reading with uh, David and with PJ. So I think it was maybe just the three of us that they were really carefully kind of testing before they, you know, made offers and stuff. But unlike the the pilot process, which I think I never answered your question about how long that process will draw out in pilot season, which doesn't really exist anymore. But oftentimes when when a, when a show is getting ready to go to production on television, um, everything happens fairly quickly. Um, unlike I would say, like you hear stories about movie roles, like the Harry Potter kids getting discovered, you know, that process just went on forever. And they would have to go in multiple, multiple times just to the point where you're like, why am I doing? I don't even want to go anymore. It's so hard. Every time you leave, you think that was probably it. I'm going to get cut. Um, so that can, but, but in, but in television, it can be a very condensed process. It's like, you get an audition, you go in and read for, you know, if you're, if you're not skipping any of those steps, it can still all happen within a week. It can just be boom, mm. boom, boom, boom. Okay. Like you can test for the studio and then later that afternoon you can test for the network. So that can be very quick because sometimes casting is like the last thing they do right before they're like, whoa, 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 we have to shoot. It's almost like they forgot. Oh, wait, we, we need actors. <laughs> we need people. Yeah. We need people. <laughs> Whereas voiceover, um, that often can take a lot of time. And I don't, to be honest with you, I'd love to talk to someone in more detail about this who's on the other side. I don't know necessarily why it takes so long. I don't know if they're doing like animation tests with people's voices or what, but I definitely remember the Cora thing being like, there was so much space in between each of those auditions that every time I had long since assumed that that it was over and I was not coming back and that they had cast the role. And that's happened with a few different voiceover jobs where you 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 have you're like oh god like when someone says they want you for this you go wait what like i gotta look go back and look at my calendar to see when i even first auditioned for that that seems like it was ages ago um so that was a really long process and when i got the call that i got it you know i i i had once again sort of let it go and so i was completely shocked and so excited and you know i i remember um, I've told this story before. It's not really a story, but um, the like the first day that I went in to record the first episode because it had gone, it had been picked up to series. It wasn't just a pilot. Um, the casting director, like the head of casting at Nickelodeon, um, who had been in part of this process all along the way, like so excitedly came in when we were recording and like stayed and like you know she, the casting people usually aren't there by that point they cast and then they move on they're casting other stuff but it was such a high profile thing that she was sort of around for it. a couple of them were around for it and i remember she um kind of grabbed me afterwards uh in between the two bathrooms and <laughs> was like are you ready for your life to change and i was like I've heard that before, you know, because it's a thing that happens a lot in Hollywood. You know, there's a lot of like, oh, my gosh, you got this part. This is going to break everything wide open or like this is where you become a household name. And, you know, everyone, I think, goes through that, except for those rare people who really are just like plucked out of nowhere. And their first big job is they're on a huge NBC sitcom. I mean, that can happen, but it's very, very rare. So I remember being like. I mean, sure, like, yeah, I'm sure that seems true. Um, and then <laughs> and then it then then it was true more so than it's ever been true with anything I've ever done. Absolutely. She was completely right. Um, it changed my entire life. It changed. Um, it, yeah, it just it just, you know, because I still I do cons and now I do this podcast for them where, you know, it's way, way, way more than a rewatch podcast. I don't like those, that term. Um, and I think that's probably true for most rewatch podcasts. There's so much more than that. But we we have uh, almost more like deep dive, just like building this universe episodes than we do like recap episodes where we just talk very specifically about the episode. Um, but we do this, I do this podcast called Braving the Elements with Dante who plays Zuko uh, in the first series. And and just the whole experience of feeling like any, like something I did for a job made makes a real emotional difference in people's lives. You know, a lot of the time you do stuff and you don't have the, you know, you could be on a great show and it could move people, but it's not necessarily something that people get 
to go to Comic Cons for. You know, it's a very specific kind of world. And so once you have that first experience of someone to your face being like, I came out to my parents because of your show, or, you know, I was going through a really hard time, or um, I'm a vet, I came back from Afghanistan and I found the Legend of Korra and that made me feel less, you know, like I was alone in these PTS experiences I was having. That kind of stuff, uh, that's like, that's made my life matter in a way that nothing I've ever done has. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, priceless. my life completely changed. It's priceless. I will say it is one of my favorite shows of all time. It's <laughs> me too, man. Me absolutely, too. Absolutely. It's absolutely brilliant. I have to kind of force myself not to just rewatch it and rewatch it and rewatch it. Yeah. You gotta make sure it almost makes me like want to watch it more when I actually do. You know, so yeah. I'll probably I'll probably watch it like once a year. I'll go back, yeah. watch through it. And it's just phenomenal. It's just totally a phenomenal show. Yeah. Yeah. Those, um, so, they're both so yeah. I mean, I I mean, you know, again, do getting to do this podcast means that every time we do an episode, I watch an episode of Avatar The Lost Airbender. We haven't gotten to Korra yet, but I will watch it like three times back to back before we record, having already seen it a bunch of times. And yeah. I don't even care. Like I will literally start it right over and one single episode I'll start over from the beginning and be like, yeah, like, what am I going to notice this time? Even though I yeah. just watched this 15 minutes ago. They're both such great shows. And I love how they're different. Oh, yeah. Like, they're, they're so like, different. They're both so brilliant in their own way. Agreed. For me, for me, absolutely on the same level. Like, I really. Abs I totally agree. I know passion. that there's a lot Strong. of. Yeah, there's a lot of people that uh, the unspoken thing that you're not saying is that there are a lot of people who grew up with Avatar who have just absolutely adamantly refused to even get into Korra exactly. because it's not Aang. And I totally understand that. Again, huge fan of the show. I'm really sad that we're going to be like that we will have gotten to the end of book three by the end of our next season of the podcast. Um, you'd think that I would just be super excited to get into Korra, but I'm I don't want to leave those kids behind. So I completely understand but I also have a lot of people now. Well, it's interesting because now so many people that find the shows find both shows at the same time um, because they're younger for whatever reason, you know, it's on Netflix, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they'll watch them out of order or, you know, they just roll right into the second one. And so there isn't that same loyalty to the first show. So those people are like, what are you talking about? What do you mean there's like a an internet movement of people who don't want Korra to be an avatar and like just want Aang to live forever? It's like... That's not really how the Avatar cycle works. You sort of are, <laughs> you're sort of denying the entire structure of that entire universe if mm -hmm. you can't accept that. But I, mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. People love what they love, and um, but I hope I always I'm always, on the podcast. I'm like the door is always open. Core will always be there, and there are so many people too that I meet now who are like almost apologetic like okay it took me like seven years to like, mm -hmm. actually like stop hating on a thing i had never watched and watched it and now it's like my favorite thing in the world i really identify with it da, da, da. And <laughs> so that's kind of fun too that's like the you know that's a fun different conversation to to have yeah i think, well, I think and i think it speaks to how special that show is and how powerful yeah. it is for people yeah for sure well, so and it keeps resonating those both of those series like Yes. I was watching them over the pandemic. I was like, they might as well have written this yesterday. Like this feels yeah. more relevant now than it did, you know, almost 20 years ago when it first came out. It's timeless. That's that's not yeah. discovered both shows. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So you didn't really know at the outset how big it was going to be, how significant it was going to be. Well, I mean, I was a fan of the first series, so I knew it was a big deal. But I think there's just so you just have you try to protect yourself so much after you've been doing this for a while that I just didn't. Um, I just I thought, well, I'll, I, I mean, I really was like, I'm sure I'll get fired. You know, I mean, it was that feeling of trying to protect yourself. I've never been fired from a job. I've never been fired from, from a job, but I know so many people who have. And again, it's like the more you love something and I think people can universally understand this above and beyond like performing or being an artist like hasn't there been a time when something really special and exciting has happened to you and your first thought has been like oh god i hope nothing goes wrong mm -hmm. like oh god i hope this is real mm -hmm. um i hope i hope what's gonna what could possibly you know maybe maybe this will get taken away from me in the cruelest way possible like you just don't you know we're very protective and if you've been hurt by anything it's really easy to kind of go to that place and so that was part of it for me was like I genuinely was I, I genuinely was so I was so excited that I was like uh, I'm not gonna feel anything about this so that when I get fired 
um, I won't care, you know. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, defense mechanism. Yeah. yeah, and then and then after you know halfway through the first season, I was like, well, they haven't replaced me yet. And then when we went to San Diego Comic Con for like a like the te like teaser stuff where they sort of you know the the creators like reveal some designs and all of that, and we were in the the biggest hall, which is like four thousand people or something um walking out onto that stage to that many people like applauding was terrifying mm -hmm. um <laughs> but that was definitely a moment of like uh oh this is this this is a big deal <laughs> like this is yeah i'm gonna have to just accept that this is a really big deal with all the fear that comes along with that you know yeah so day to day working on the show what was it like were you in the booth doing these lines with people a lot or were yes. you often alone Okay, you almost are. never alone, almost okay. never alone. Um, yeah, that's another thing that I really appreciate about Nickelodeon is that they they really make a, a concerted effort always to get as many actors to are in scenes together to read together and to record together. Um, because they understand that dynamic that you and I were just talking about, you know, you just it's just can be different. And, um, and so yeah, so we so I would record, I think, you know, we record it once a week. Um, an episode, you know, a day you go in for a day of recording an episode and, um, by and large, I mean, I'm trying to think, you know, I know when they did like Avatar The Last Airbender, for example, almost everyone was in LA, but Zach who played Aang was not. So he was, but they would still like pipe him in. They would try really hard not to have him have to record his line separately. They would just, everyone would just hear him, but they couldn't see him. Um, but uh, and and for Cora, yeah, I mean, I, you know, JK being as incredibly busy as he has always been because he's a tremendous success and everyone wants to work with him like he was at our recordings. I got to record with JK and I was always with with David and, and PJ and um, and it was such a family and Seychelles and um, and getting to record with, you know, Steve Bloom, who played Amon and um, getting to record with the adversaries was like it was so cool because they were all such amazing actors and you know having the this happens with like I know I, I know I'm, Dante talks about this too like when he recorded with Mark Hamill Mark Hamill was like behind him and so he just had this like powerful intimidating person who's the kindest person in the world as all voice actors seem to be uh, but you know he just felt like the hairs on his back of his neck standing up because he wasn't looking at and that's how they did it with like Zaheer for me like Henry Rollins was like way in the back in the sort of dark corner of the studio um and and he was just in my ears and I could just feel him back there again nicest funniest dude but you know it definitely helps and um and it was so fun and we would do table reads and you know be around this giant table and all of these heroes of mine that they for some reason just kept knowing to cast even though they had no idea they were my heroes too you know I would just like show up and be like okay, Clancy Brown is here. Uh, try not to wet your pants. This is very exciting, you know? <laughs> um, so that all of that was just a complete and total dream. Um, it was it was so special. And, you know, all the way down to like the recording engineer, Justin is so funny and it just becomes a family. You're, you know, you become this family and um, it's, it's a very joyful experience, even though it's very different from showing up to set. And, you know, that's, an, that's a whole other, even larger family that I would never want to let go of either. You know, I love yeah. being in the makeup trailer. I love like connecting with the war wardrobe person whenever somebody comes up on a set and starts like futzing with something that they like straightening my necklace. I always like try to st straighten something on them. Mm. So that it's like, this is mutual. <laughs> um, like I love all that. Again, the team, you, the team, you know, mm -hmm. I love teams in all their forms. So, um, but it's a, but it's a really, um, yeah, it's a really special experience. And when you are recording by yourself, um, it's just not as fun. It's, I mean, that's, I'm sure everyone would agree. I don't want to insult anybody, but like, you know, when I did um, Injustice, the when I did Wonder Woman for, for Warner Brothers in this movie, um, I recorded by myself. The people that I was recording with were wonderful and funny and great, but there were only, you know, three or four of them. And they were not actors. They were just there as the director and the writer and the, you know, executive and the recording. And I, I you know, I was like, but, but, I don't, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to even like I, and it was again, also during COVID, they might've done it completely differently had it not been during COVID. Um, so I really had to be in a room by myself. Um, but you know, you want that experience of being like, Hey, you play Superman. I play Wonder Woman. You play Batman. I play Wonder Woman. Like, 
I never met those guys unless I had already worked with them, some of which I had. But, you know, it's it was very bittersweet. So I was like, but I yeah. want to have that experience of like being an actor with my actors, you know? Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Um, By the end of Cora, were you like, this has been amazing. I'm ready for it to wrap up. Or were you like, let's do this forever? Oh, I would have done it forever. Yeah. I would have done it forever. I also feel like I'm trying, mm. I'm hard pressed to think of a job that I genuinely, that I did for any period of time that I really would have wanted to be over. And I'm so grateful for that. You know, I think about if I look at like things that I that I did more than once, um, I can't I'm trying but can't think of a single thing that I'm not like if someone was like, we're bringing you the worst back. I'd be like, I'll be there tomorrow. Uh, you know, if, if we got to do Stand Against Evil again, uh, another season of that, I would go there. I couldn't I wouldn't get there. I couldn't get there fast enough, you know, um, and certainly that's true of, of anything in Avatar. And that's why you know i've stayed so connected to it and why i have like was pushing for a podcast for years before they actually did it um because nickelodeon just did, wasn't in podcasting but i was like let me do it let me do it let me do it and silver lining covid was that opportunity you know for as devastating as it was and as much as i would not wish it on anyone um and it was so hard for so many of us that is a silver lining that was a thing where it was like that opened a window and you know hopefully that is true for uh, other people, you know, people who have, who have like re realized they don't want to do the job that they were doing or, you know, did write that book or just found out that they, you know, were in the wrong marriage or <laughs> were in the right one or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, I hope that there are like the then growth opportunities for, you know, all of us on some level through that. Yeah. Amazing. I do have another question about Cora. Yeah. Because this is the vocal arts podcast. Sure. I'm interested in actually your vocal approach to the role because oh, yeah. it is your voice. You can yeah, hear it. You can hear you, you can hear, yeah, the total core of it is your voice. Did you yeah. do anything differently than you just are speaking right now to 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 portray Cora? Yeah, I mean, so when I got the audition, I mean, I, and, I, and I had done, you know, these auditions that I was doing for other Nickelodeon cartoons, as you can imagine, I mean, the stuff I was doing for like, which came after Cora, but stuff I was doing for Sanjay and Craig, like I, it was exactly what you would hope as a sketch comedian. They would be like, you're going to be playing a talking bobcat this week, or, you know, you're someone who's Southern or whatever um, with Cora. Uh, I didn't know, I don't know that we got that much direction either. Sometimes you really don't get direction on what the voice is supposed to sound like, and you're kind of on your own. And that's where improv is also very helpful because it teaches you to be really flexible. So if you go into a room and you have this great voice picked out and you're so excited about it and you've worked so hard on it and you do it and they're like, that was so funny and great. Um, we're looking for someone who's like maybe 20 years younger than that and uh, has <laughs> like maybe a little bit of like a stutter or whatever, you know you have to just respond on the fly to show like, oh, okay, yeah, I can adjust to that. Here's my take on that. Um, whereas I think if you're not, if you haven't conditioned yourself to be that flexible, it, you, you can be a deer in the headlights and just go, well, uh, this is this is, this is is what I did. Sorry, I, what? Bye. <laughs> um, so with Cora, they were like, you know, we really like the natural sound of your voice. We're looking for natural voices. Hence, everyone's voice kind of sounds like their voice. Um, and uh, And I think what I had really focused on with that because there wasn't a specific person or type, you know, there are definitely voiceover actors are often very open about, you know, it's very helpful for them to pick a person that they imagine that character kind of being somewhat like. So if it's, you know, oh, like I imagine this guy being like Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily trying to do an impression of Hugh Jackman because they will hear that. But it's like, what do I sound like filtered through that lens? Um, and so that was one of the things that like a coach had really helped me with because that, that felt like cheating to me. You know what I mean? I was like, what? No, you have to come up with something out of nothing. And they're like, that's not a thing anymore. Like everything's been done. It's okay. <laughs> like you're still going to do something different than, you know, we're not asking you to do impressions, whatever. So I think for me, when I found out that they wanted natural voices and they didn't want me to do that much, what I focused on was like, who has the attitude? Like, is there, there's there an actor or a character that has the attitude of this kind of saucy teenager um and the person that i came up with was christina ricci so in my mind i was like oh christina ricci is so good at playing these like over it 
Like, mm-hmm. yeah, let's go ahead and like, I'm Wednesday Adams. And she was in this book, uh, book, book. She was in this uh, movie called The Opposite of Sex, which I highly recommend. It's an indie movie that Lisa Kudrow is also in. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful movie. Um, but she plays this, she plays this teenager who's just like, she's narrating the whole time and she's kind of over it. And she's hiding her feelings, which are very deep mm-hmm. and personal because she, you know, has to seem like she's just too cool. And she's like, it would be really stupid if she were vulnerable. So, and so that's what I, that's what I had in my head was like that kind of a Christina Ricci, like too cool for school kind of person in my head. Um, and it is so I, funny how that connected, you know, just hearing, like I said, cause when you're speaking normally, I can hear the core in there, but just that tiny switch of intention yeah. like completely makes it intention crystal clear. It's like, word. Oh, there's Cora. Like, yeah. boom, right. Yeah. When you, right. When you switch the intention, it does enough vocally. Like yeah. there is physiology changing in yeah. there. You're not even thinking about it. And those minor shifts are enough to be like, that's it. Yeah, totally, totally. And I have, I mean, my range is all over the place because I'm a clown. So, um, <laughs> you know, I would definitely, my voice is naturally a little bit lower than Cora's, but it's also will go to a much higher register than Cora will go. Um, and so that was something that I think we definitely kind of like settled on pretty early. It was just, just like, what's Cora's range? Um, where does she live? And when, and and so there would be times at the very beginning where we would start recording and Andrea Romano would be like, um, you sound too old. Like, let's remember to like kind of pull it back up into being a, a little bit younger. You're a little bit younger. You're kind of living in this space. And um, and so that was very helpful. And then as the series progressed, um, you know, with like someone like Zach, his voice literally was changing as he was getting older because he was Aang's age. So he didn't have to do too much because it was just happening organically. But for us, those of us who were playing teenagers, we were kind of playing with that. We were sort of turning up the age volume just a tiny pinch through each season because they were getting older. And so we were sort of, you know, that was kind of a fun, almost like it's that's that's less of a definable thing that it's just kind of a feeling that you know mike and brian the creators or andrea or ever, all of the above were sort of honing in on like you can't necessarily put your finger on it or just say like now it's a 12 now it's a 13. um but what do people because it's also people's experiences what do people go through and how does that change their cadence or you know what their stress levels sound like when they talk and stuff like that and that's all really fun stuff to play with yeah yeah it's it is amazing. It's also, yeah, I, I definitely did notice that progression throughout the show. Yeah. What's nice. also amazing to me on the animation side is that just the, the tiny subtleness in how they draw your oh, characters yeah. that make them look like a year older. I like totally you can, agree. Like you can tell, you can tell yeah. they're a little bit older, but like, what are they actually doing differently? Yeah. Like yeah, you can't. It's if amazing. you put them side by side, you're like, do I see a little bit more defined <laughs> cheekbone? Like, is there yeah, like the yeah. shaviest bit of baby fat missing? But like, each <laughs> you're doing that for each episode, like that. All of that is Incredible. magic, and we always say like, we're you know, we do part of the work, but the character is you know that we look so much better because the animation is good. That makes a, is you know, that makes the the life that breathes the life in, life into it in this totally different way and it's such harder work than what we do it's such harder work <laughs> to animate than what we do it's such a process and um it can be so tedious when it's hand drawn and like yeah. those people who are able to put that much focus and time into you know drawing to me that's like oh you're a wizard you're a wizard it is <laughs> you're unreal magic. yeah absolutely absolutely do you do any singing I do. Yeah. Okay. I love singing. That was like one of my favorite things that I don't do as much of. Like, that's the thing that my partner has to, uh, he's always like, why aren't you, why don't you sing more? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't like, <laughs> like, I don't have time to be in a band and I used to be in bands and it was so fun, but it was, it's a lot of time. You have to put in that time and I just don't have that. And so anytime I get to do something like I love improvising music with when I'm improvising with with teams that are also musical or we have a piano accompanist um, will definitely improvise songs. Um, and I love anytime anyone asks me to do a music show, I'm always like, yes, yes, I don't care what it is. Yes, 100 <laughs> percent. And I think you see that a lot in voiceover. I see a lot of singers in voiceover. OK, very cool. Whatever well, yeah, I mean, something yeah. something I've noticed about singers, too. The, you learn how to manipulate your voice to do different sure. things. So a lot of singers I know are also really good at doing accents and yes. characters and stuff because you just your figure ear, out. Your ear, man. It's, it's ear, so, it's yeah. Ear. that that The way you have the conversation with translating what you're hearing into how you 
can process that and like do some iteration of it or fit it into something like that, I think is, yeah. I think you're so right about that. That's like all part of the same kind of skill set or talent that turns into a skill set for sure. Totally. Absolutely. Okay. Um, one more thing before we go. Yeah. Totally. What are some of your dreams or like big career goals or big maybe projects sure that sure you, that you'd like to do or make happen that you haven't gotten a chance to yet oh man um well i would love to do another and, and not for lack of like trying or hoping but um i would love to do another series that ha has that same resonance but that's like maybe part of a different universe um like i got to do a voice on harley quinn which i think is such a great show for HBO and I definitely was like, I mean, you cast me as Mira, no reason she can't um, be in every episode <laughs> ongoing. Um, so I would love to, I would love to do something in that world. Um, you know, I, something in the Marvel world would be amazing. Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to be, I guess I'm, I guess I'm promoting stuff that, but whatever. Uh, yep, it's animation, it's, it's fine, it's animation. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and, and so that's, that's, that's uh definitely those things are are would be huge and so fun um those are those are definitely big ones uh i'm trying to think if there's anything god i mean yeah i mean i would love to do another great tv series I, it's i'm i i will say that i think one of the things that has worked for me but also worked against me is that i've i'm so open to anything um, even if I haven't, even if I don't know what it is yet, or it's a thing I've never heard of, but I'm just decide I'm game for, I feel like I am, I've never been the person that's like, well, that she's the go-to person for X. And there are definitely people who have done very well for themselves by being like the snarky girl with glasses. And I know that sounds like diminutive, but I don't mean it that way. I mean, like, that's sweet because that is how Hollywood works. They are like, we need, who's that one person? And then they have that person in their head and they're like, well, that's the person who does that. So that's who I want. Um, whereas there are others of us, um, and I would count Dante in, in there too, who are like, I, I want to direct, I want to produce, I want to write, I love poetry, I love singing, I love playing guitar, I love, you know. And so you sort of spread yourself across all these different uh, things. And it, it can definitely mean that you, um, you're not just like on a track, which I think can be really useful for people. You're just kind of like all over the place, but I wouldn't give up any of that stuff. So I guess my ultimate answer is like, I don't necessarily have a specific goal because so much of the stuff that I have loved doing, I didn't expect to come into my life. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful answer. Okay, Great. any Thank final God. words to young actors slash the audience and the fans who are watching? Oh gosh. Um, well, I guess I would just say, like, you know, keep just really stay connected to the idea that um, that it's it's a group effort always. And that um, that's kind of for me the best thing about it. And that doesn't mean that you can't go and do a solo show or be a stand up or anything like that. You're still going to find yourself in a community of people and you're still going to have the opportunity to, like, become a person that people want around them. Um, and, and yeah, just, just like appreciate that and appreciate that you don't have to be the best at everything, that the coolest feeling is getting better at the thing you do or the things you do because you're surrounded by people who are amazing at what they do and everyone is, you know, doing it together and that that's the only way for it to feel good. It doesn't feel good if you're like really good and then the people around you are like not interested or, hmm. you know, just... I don't, and by the way, I don't mind being, I love doing like student films and stuff because that is not a, that is not a matter of like, oh, you're the best at this. It, it's like being with people who are passionate and are learning and are, you know, that's what I show up for. And so I think find, find those moments in your life and keep feeding that part of yourself and, um, and, uh, and you'll feel like whatever it is that you're doing it matters and means something and that you can be proud of. Amazing. And where can people follow you if they want to? Follow Jane of Arnie and follow sure. your journey. Um, real, I'm semi bad on social media because again, I do, I am in the middle of programming a 200 show festival. So it's really hard for me to like <laughs> do stuff, but um, I'm on TikTok at Janet Dash Varney, I think. <laughs> oh, um, I have been putting videos out um, and I'm on uh, Instagram at the JV club. 
but you can just put in Janet Varney, you'll find me. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not really on whatever we call the, just the bird. Google your, Google your name and, and find. You can do that. You can definitely do that. I have a website, <laughs> on the called, website that's yeah. just JanetVarney.com that, that takes you to all those different places. And there's stuff about Cora on there and all that too. Brilliant. Janet, thank yeah. you so much Thanks, for joining yeah. me today. Teaching Dream come me about, true. Yeah, to talk the to Santa you. Fe Opera. What a what a treat. That <laughs> what was a like, I love that we got a chance to talk about that because it's like so fresh in my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will keep so you welcome. keep you posted on when this is going public and Great. so on. But I'm very grateful Ooh. to have spoken with you and yes, hope you blast. have a wonderful day and good luck with everything. Thank you. You too. I feel like I, I, I had the window open a crack and at one point there was a helicopter going by. I was like, Janet, why did you let that window stay open? <laughs> But now I feel like I can smell a skunk. So I'm not sure what's happening outside. <laughs> I'm going to go check that out. See if I have a buddy out there that's going to spray me in the middle of the day. Wonderful. That's what we uh, love. <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. Well, I'll, uh, I'll see you on the email. Bye. Sounds good. Okay. Bye. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>